This episode is sponsored by Atomic Child. Do you love the outdoors and wish that you had a way to keep it with you throughout your week, especially while most of us are holed up at home? Atomic Child is an artist-run brand that is inspired by nature. They capture the great outdoors through unique designs. Their designs can be found on stickers, blankets, water bottles, mugs, pins, patches and more at AtomicChild.com. We bring nature to you. Stephen Stainer disappeared on his way home from school in Merced, California. He was seven years old. Apparently, uh, Stephen had been kidnapped and told that he had been adopted. For seven years, his parents never gave up hope that he was alive. This episode contains descriptions of child sexual abuse that listeners may find disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Crime Labs. I'm Eileen. And I'm Charlie. Most child abduction cases in the US are committed by one of the parents of the child. It is very rare for a child to be abducted by a stranger, and normally when this occurs, the outcome is beyond comprehension. It is even more rare that a child comes home, especially after seven years, two months, and 28 days. Someone once said, Strength doesn't come from what you can do. It comes from overcoming the things you once thought you couldn't. This is Going Home, the story of Stephen Stainer. On December 4th, 1972, seven-year-old Stephen Stainer was abducted on his way home from school. He grew up with a new identity, believing his parents had given him away to the man he now called Dad. Stephen was repeatedly sexually assaulted, physically abused and psychologically broken by his captor. He never tried to escape until seven years later when he heard another little boy being told the same lies and he knew he could not let it happen again. Stephen was the middle child of Kay and Delbert Stainer. He had three sisters and an older brother. As a kid, it wasn't unusual for him to get in trouble at home. He was mischievous but sensitive. He adored his parents. The day he went missing, he knew he was going to get in trouble for carving his name on the garage door of his family home. He took his time walking when he was approached by a man handing out gospel tracts. The man said he was a representative of the church and was looking for donations. He asked Stephen if he thought his mother would have anything to donate. Stephen said yes. The man then offered him a lift home so he could collect the items. A white Buick pulled up. The man with the flyers gestured for Stephen to get in. The naive seven-year-old climbed inside and his life changed forever. Over the next seven years, plenty would change in the Stainer's life but Stephen's name remained carved into the garage door. The driver of the car was Kenneth Barnell. He was a convicted sex offender. He had problems from an early age. Psychologists said that he needed help. He spent years in and out of juvenile detention centres before serving three and a half years in an adult prison for, quote, lewd and lascivious behaviour with a child, unquote. He also had convictions for armed robbery and impersonating a police officer. The Purnell had convinced Irvin Edward Murphy that he was planning on becoming a minister and needed to abduct a young boy to raise in a quote, religious type deal, unquote. The two had met while working at Yosemite National Park. Murphy was described by those who knew him as simple-minded, naive and trusting. On Purnell's instruction, Murphy had been handing out religious flowers to young boys on their way home from school and Stephen Stainer happened to be the boy who agreed to help. After initially saying no a few times, Stephen got into Parnell's car with Murphy, thinking he was going home. Instead, Parnell drove Stephen to a cabin, close to his grandmother's house in Cathy's Valley. Parnell told Stephen that he had spoken to his parents, who said that it was okay with them that he stayed the night. Parnell committed the first of countless sexual assaults the very next morning. The abuse escalated over the first few weeks and continued for years. As Stephen cried for his parents, Parnell told him that his parents didn't want him anymore. He told the young boy that the Stainers could not afford him and they had granted Parnell legal custody. From then on, he would be known as Dennis Parnell. Less than a month after his abduction, 
Stephen was enrolled in a school under the name Dennis, with Parnell pretending to be his father. Across the next few years, Stephen and Parnell moved around California. Flyers had been sent out to all schools in the district, but they were never seen at Steel Lane Elementary where Stephen had been enrolled. A woman named Barbara Mathias moved in with them for two years, and she too began to abuse Stephen. Years later, she would deny this, even meeting Stephen's parents under the guise of his childhood babysitter to let them know how well behaved he had been. Parnell had a series of menial jobs, and to anyone outside of the home he shared with Stephen, they were just normal father and son. He even worked away at times, giving Stephen a chance to escape, but he never did. He believed he had nowhere else to go. He had been told that his parents didn't want him. Parnell would manipulate Stephen. It was a fine line between complete control and total freedom. He gave Stephen a dog a gesture most seven-year-olds would think was genuine care. But true care was closer than he would ever know. Family members lived just a few hundred feet from the first place he was kept, his maternal grandparents. But he believed his parents didn't want him. He never told anyone of the horrors he was subjected to by the man pretending to be his father. Parnell allowed Stephen to live without boundaries, convinced the boy would remain loyal, He didn't know how very missed he was at home in Merced. Stephen's father became obsessed with finding Stephen. The family sent out flyers that read, quote, Missing juvenile, Stephen Gregory Stainer, male, Caucasian, age 7. Date of birth, 4-18-65. 4 foot 8, 60 pounds, light brown hair. The hair is shaggy and collar length, brown eyes. Missing since 12 4, 72 from this city. Stephen was on his way home from school when he was last seen. He was last seen wearing a tan coat, blue jeans, multicoloured flower shirt with a zipper on the front. Stephen has never run away in the past. This may be a case of foul play or kidnapping. Any information on the above juvenile, please contact Sergeant Moore, Merced Police Department. Unquote. The family would travel long distances to talk to anyone they thought might have information. Any mention of Stephen on the news would bring Dell to tears. At one point, Stephen's father found a bag with what he knew to be something dead inside. He opened the bag and was inconsolable with the built-up fear and relief that it was a calf inside and not his little boy. Stephen's mother Kay was becoming more retreated. She remained silent as Dell fell apart. They worked tirelessly to find their son but he remained missing for seven years, two months and 14 days before another family were about to go through the same pain. Kenneth Parnell allowed Stephen to come and go as he pleased. Without any guidance and probably to help cope with the trauma, Stephen began drinking and smoking at a young age. Each night he was subjected to brutal sexual assaults. His high school girlfriend told ABC News that he quote, had a great personality, unquote. He did well in school, he had friends and played sports, and to everybody else he seemed like a normal kid. Dennis Parnell was just another kid in class, and no one could have known what was going on in the place that he called home. As Stephen aged, and grew out of Parnell's sick preferential age, he was told to try and get another boy for Parnell. Stephen would intentionally sabotage these kidnap attempts to prevent another child from going through what he did. Parnell then bribed one of Stephen's teenage friends, Sean Pullman, to help him kidnap a little blonde boy he'd had his eye on in Ukiah, California. They planned to lure the boy to the car, pretending to need assistance, but the boy said no. He ran towards his home as Parnell shouted at Pullman to, quote, get him, unquote. He chased the child until they reached a chain fence. Sean Pullman pried the boy's tiny fingers from the fence as he screamed in terror. He threw him into Parnell's car and they sped off. The little boy was five-year-old Timothy White. His parents were terrified. Despite the frenzied abduction, no one saw a thing. Appeals were broadcast, flyers were distributed and searches were launched, but Timmy was gone. Just like he had done seven years earlier, Parnell wasted no time in changing Timmy's appearance, dyeing the boy's hair brown and changing his clothes. 
He renamed Timmy and began telling him the same lies that he had told Stephen. It was hearing Timmy being told the same things that made Stephen realise just how bad things had been. He knew Timmy had a family missing him, and he thought maybe he did too. Timmy cried for his parents every day. Stephen made sure he was home early from school each day so that Parnell couldn't abuse the little boy like he had done to him. Stephen took care of Timmy, and he knew that he could not let the five-year-old go through what he did. After growing attached to Timmy, Stephen knew he had to get him to safety. Two weeks after Timmy had been abducted, they left Parnell's home together while he was working a shift as a security worker. They hitchhiked over 40 miles to Ukiah, where Timmy was from. Stephen often carried Timmy, who was tired and crying, through the rain as they tried to find Timmy's house. Timmy couldn't remember where he lived and no one was home at his babysitter's house, so Stephen looked up the address to the local police station and they walked there hand in hand. As they got to the police station at midnight, Stephen told Timmy to go inside and tell the policeman his name and that they would bring him home to his parents. Timmy was frightened and didn't want Stephen to leave. He ran back to him, sobbing, and at this point a police officer approached them. Suspicious of the older boy, the police brought them both inside, where Stephen eventually told his story, that he had been abducted seven years earlier, and that he had been told to call his abductor dad. He knew that Timmy was kidnapped because he heard him being told the same lies he had been told all those years earlier. Early the next morning, Kenneth Parnell was arrested on suspicion of abducting both children. Police realised he had previous convictions of sodomy, but he had never been suspected of anything because he never registered as a sex offender. Following June, Kenneth Parnell was convicted of kidnapping Stephen Stainer and Timothy Whites. Over the course of the separate trials, Parnell's defence attorney stated that Stephen could have left at any time but chose not to. They said that the kidnapping occurred before California's three-year statute of limitations and therefore could not be prosecuted for that offence. Prosecutors argued that Stephen was a psychological prisoner and the kidnapping was a continuous event for the entire seven years. A psychologist testified that Parnell would switch between violent sexual abuse and, quote, extraordinary freedom, unquote. Stephen was effectively brainwashed into thinking he had no other option but to stay. He had come to believe that the life he had with his abuser was the only life he would ever have. He didn't know that his family was searching for him, or even cared. Stephen also said that Barbara Matthias, who had lived with them for a few years previously, had also sexually abused him, but she was never prosecuted. Irvin Murphy, the vulnerable man Parnell had duped into assisting him, was convicted of kidnapping. Sean Poorman, who assisted in the kidnapping of Timothy White, was also convicted and sentenced to time in a juvenile correctional facility. Kenneth Parnell was not charged with the hundreds of sexual assaults he committed against Stephen Stainer and other boys. This was because they occurred outside of the jurisdiction of the Merced County Prosecutor and were, at the time of the trial, outside of the statute of limitations. The Mendocino County prosecutors decided not to prosecute Parnell for the sexual assaults. This decision was believed to be because they thought they were protecting Stephen from the stigma associated with rape and molestation victims. Stephen's parents were also reluctant for him to speak about it. He only briefly attended counselling. He was bullied at school once he returned to normalcy, but life would never be normal again. Stephen's father insisted he didn't need any treatment or therapy. Years later, Stephen said, quote, I never reached out to talk about it with my parents and they never pushed to find out, unquote. Not allowing Stephen to speak out about the sexual abuse he suffered only perpetuated the shame he felt. Stephen had lived half his life as Dennis. People often question why he didn't just leave sooner or how he began to call his abuser dad. Jennifer Freyd, a psychologist at the University of Oregon, said, quote, Someone who's kidnapped as a child might make an unconscious decision to not fully see the abuse and bond with the person providing food and shelter, unquote. Stephen was effectively brainwashed and manipulated into thinking he couldn't do any better than Parnell. The longer he was with Parnell without his parents coming for him, the more sure he was that they had given him up. Despite the clear lack of love shown to Stephen in the seven years he was with Parnell, 
he was still capable of care and insurmountable courage. He did not want Timmy White to go through the years of abuse that he had, and he made sure that Timmy was never touched and took him to safety. Even when they were free and at the police station, Timmy did not want Stephen to leave. That speaks to the level of security Stephen gave the five-year-old. In regards to the sexual abuse, Merced County did not prosecute Purnell because the statute of limitations had run out. Mendocino County chose not to prosecute, either because they wanted to spare Stephen from having to testify about the abuse, or his parents did not want him to. The legislation surrounding kidnapping convictions changed after this case to ensure the offenders serve consecutive sentences for each offence. Once Stephen and Timmy were free, they were surrounded by media coverage. It is not often two kidnapped children return home. Everyone wanted his story, but only the redeeming parts of it. Just two weeks after he escaped, he did a televised interview on Good Morning America, where he spoke about returning home after seven years and described what happened on the day he was abducted. Good morning, uh, Stephen and Mr. and Mrs. Stainer. And Stephen, how does it feel to be home? It feels great. Did you remember your parents well? Um... They didn't change that much. Uh, I, I recognized them when I got out of the car. What about your brothers and sisters? Uh, they changed a lot. I never recognized either one of them. Uh, yes, um, I was walking home from school, and I was stopped by a man along the street just a few blocks from my house, and he uh, asked me if I wanted to me or my my mother wanted to donate something to a church and I had told him that uh, my mother would probably want to and so he offered me a ride home. I had um, refused the first time telling him that uh, my house is just a few blocks away and he had asked me several more times and after a while I had taken a ride and then uh, a car pulled up, and I got in, and they they passed the road that I was that I lived on, and I had told them that that was the road I lived on. They said that we'll just uh, call your parents see if you can stay the night. Were you afraid? Uh, not that much. I was. A little bit. He then went on to describe how he came to think that his parents had given him up and Parnell was his new father. Well, the first night they had said they called my parents and said it was all right that I stayed the night. The second night they said that they had called them again and said they, that I could stay another night. Then um, one of them went to uh, went out and came back and said that he went to court and got in possession of me and said that I was his. When he was back in Merced with his family, he was now expected to live by their rules with four other children in the house. For seven years I'd been uh, supposedly an only child. Now I had uh, to compete with a brother and three sisters. You were away for seven years and a lot of people still wonder why you didn't try to escape before you finally did escape three years mm -hmm. ago. When you look back on that, why do you think that is, Stephen? Well, there's there's several reasons. I was told I was adopted. You believed it? Yes, I believed it. Stephen argued with his parents, unsure how to slot back into his old life, when the one he had been living was so vastly different. His family were eager to forget anything that ever happened, but Stephen had trouble adjusting. Stephen returned home differently. He was not the little boy who had disappeared. He'd been living a life beyond comprehension, and probably beyond the expressional limits of a 14-year-old. With Parnell, he had been drinking and smoking, and spent a lot of his time alone or doing what he wanted when he wasn't being sexually abused. Stephen was suddenly a household name, and a hero. There are photos of Stephen holding Timmy White. Stephen is a tall, well-dressed teen with a mop of brown hair, and in his arms, Timmy seems so small. They are smiling at each other, more like brothers than Kenneth Parnell would have ever imagined. Stephen was mercilessly bullied in school. 
the stigma of sexual abuse clearly evident as news reports describe the seven years of child rape as homosexual activity. It is generally known that there was homosexual activity involved in Stephen's abduction. Stephen was kicked out of his home as an older teenager. He was unable to abide by his parents' rules and his father put him out. In a 1984 interview with Newsweek, he said, quote, I returned almost a grown man, and yet my parents saw me at first as their seven-year-old. After they stopped trying to teach me the fundamentals all over again, it got better. But why doesn't my dad hug me anymore? Everything has changed. Sometimes I blame myself. I don't know sometimes if I should have come home. Would I have been better off if I didn't? Unquote. Stephen's parents, especially his father, expected him to act in the manner that he would if they had raised him, but someone else raised Stephen Sainer. The abuse may have ended the day Stephen and Timmy ran hand in hand, but he was constantly reminded of it daily in school, the newspapers, and in his own memories. Kenneth Parnell was sentenced to seven years in prison for what he did to Stephen Stainer and Timothy White. He only served three and a half years, less time than he had held Stephen captive. Stephen Stainer's kidnapper has now been released from prison after serving three and a half years. Stephen wondered why he should pay for treatment when he'd been talking to reporters for years. He worked with child abduction groups and gave interviews, believing he could save another child from what he had gone through. His story was told countless times. The novelty of being an icon wore off, but there's no escape from your past when it's continuously broadcast to the masses. Any chance I get to talk about it, I think, really helps me deal with the, the problem. The more I talk about it, uh, the, the better I can deal with it. Stephen helped to make a movie from his story, advising on it, and even having a minor role as a police officer. The movie is called My Name is Stephen. When Stephen was 20 years old, he married his girlfriend Jodie. The couple went on to have two children. The kids were Stephen's world. He settled down finally finding a loving family where he fit in. His children, Ashley and Stephen Jr., were never far from sight. Stephen joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and was practising his faith. On September 16, 1989, Stephen was working at a pizza restaurant. He was eager to get home to his family. It was raining heavily and his boss offered him the company pickup truck to save him getting wet. But instead, fearing he would get in trouble for driving without a licence, Stephen got on his motorbike. On his way home, a car pulled out from a side road and he collided with it. Stephen was driving below the speed limit, but he wasn't wearing a helmet. He was pronounced dead at a local hospital less than an hour later. He was just 24 years old. 500 people attended his funeral four days later in the church he had joined not long before. One of his pallbearers was a now 14-year-old. Timmy White. His church counsellor spoke about the internal struggle Stephen had been battling. In his eulogy he said, quote, before he was kidnapped he was just Stephen Stainer, unquote. He went on to say that when Stephen came home he was a national figure that had to be shared. His family members spoke of waiting for the phone to ring to say he was okay because that's what happened before. Jodie was widowed at 20 years old. Poignant words were inscribed on Stephen's casket. They read, Going home. Timmy White's story went differently. Stephen saved him from years of trauma and abuse. He got to grow up relatively normal because of Stephen. Timothy even forgave Sean Pullman for assisting Parnell in his kidnapping. He became an LA County Sheriff Department deputy. He also married and had two children. On April 1st, 2010, he died. Aged just 35, from a pulmonary embolism. Two lives, brought together by horrific events, both ended too soon. Stephen and Timmy were celebrated. They overcame and escaped unspeakable horror. The man who inflicted it only served five years total in prison. After he got out, Parnell stayed under the radar, giving himself a new name rather than the boys that he'd stole. In 2004, he was convicted of trying to convince a nurse to kidnap a young boy for him for $500. He was 72 years old. Timothy White testified at his trial. Stephen's earlier testimony was also read out to jurors. 
Kenneth Parnell received a sentence of 25 to life. He died an old man in January 2008. He lived a long life, longer than the boys he had taken, and he remained a danger to children until the day he died. The Stainer family had gone through serious trauma, and there was more to come. Ten years after Stephen's death, they applied to have a park named Stainer Park in his honour. The council declined, fearing people would associate it with a different Stainer, Stephen's older brother, Carey. Carey was convicted of killing four women at Yosemite National Park in 1999. He is currently on death row. On August 28, 2010, five months after Timmy White died, a statue was unveiled in Applegate Park in Merced. It depicted a teenage Stephen, hand in hand with five-year-old Timothy White, just as they had been when they escaped together on that rainy night 30 years earlier. It is a reminder of the two boys who came home, and to honour Stephen's memory as a hero. It serves as a beacon of hope to families of missing children, that someday they will all get to go home, wherever that may be. Thank you for listening to this episode. Please follow us on social media at Crime Laps and at Crime Laps Pod. You can join us a Patreon if you like. And if you like what you hear, please leave us a five-star review. Stay safe, stay home. <laughs>